Welcome everyone, broadcasting from the Wraith Game Studio. This is the Nerd Herd Podcast. I am your host, Rich Kiefer, joined today by Fry. As always. Lance T. Miller. What up? And Amber Bay. Hello, hello. Alright, so, been a week. Another week down. What so last doing? week we talked about villains. Mm-hmm. Now we're doing the opposite. Heroes. Sidekicks? Oh man, I was so close. Side- Listen to my th- sidekicks of the villains. That would be a fun one. <laughs> Villain sidekicks. Mm. Much like last week, it would be very similar format, just with heroes instead of villains. So um, before we get into that, we have some housekeeping out of the way. Those of you that are joining us for the first time, you may be asking yourself, "What is this weird but yet delightful show?" We are the Nerd Herd Podcast. So. What we do is we're just a group of friends that discuss anything nerdy from comic books, movies, board games, video games, and books. And each week we have in-depth discussions about you know different aspects of nerd culture. And this week is heroes in television movies. So let's kick it off with the first category of heroes. Sidekicks that are forced to step up when the hero is in trouble. <laughs> or when the hero just can't do shit. Or when the hero is, oh, I don't know, like, corrupted by a soul-stealing power that... Hmm. Oh, where he's like a whiny little bitch and, you know, can't simply just walk. Kind of sent on a quest (laughs) to, like, you know, I don't know, dump a ring in a volcano or something. Oh, my life is so hard. This ring's so heavy. The burden, the burden. (laughs) Take it, Gandalf. I'm a whiny bitch. So that, of course, we're talking about Samwise having to step up when Frodo ends up just failing to just not reach into yeah. the power of the ring. I get it. I, I, it's tempting. You, you can argue actually very clearly, and I, I don't see the argument, but he, he keeps up for the first, you know, book and a half, yeah. movie, movie and a half. It, it's it's not until Gollum comes into it, he, he really... Yeah, and there, of course, wouldn't really be a movie if there wasn't that inner struggle and the the fall to the temptation and everything like that. But it's really, basically the closer he gets to yeah. its master, it starts weighing on But him. the entire time, I mean, Samwise is the one who's lifting him up. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> Which is surprising because the most he could ever lift was like a hamburger or something. He's, oh, a, he's a chubby little buddy. Oh, shit, <laughs> That's a second son. breakfast. You don't need no second breakfast. <laughs> you don't even need three meals. Two. Two's enough for you. They but what about the first meal? <sighs> Come on, ah, see? Fifth yep. Meal. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. So Samwise, uh, in my opinion, definitely fits that category. He, he definitely kind of be out of that group, especially in Return of the King, kind of becomes the leader. You know, Frodo's slipping into madness and being kind of a whiny bitch. You're just going to keep going back to that. Because he is. <laughs> he go, Gollum, Gollum's out for his own purposes trying to kill him. Samwise is really the only one who steps up and goes, okay, no, seriously, we're right there. We're on the mountains. On the other side of the mountain is our goal. And all we have to do is drop the stupid thing in the lava. That's like, because Rudy knows how to win. <sighs> that, hey, Rudy. Don't. Fuck. Rudy. Don't Rudy. get me started. Rudy. Fuck Rudy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Rich is on my side. Rudy. <laughs> anyway. Oh, Rudy. All right. Hey. So, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. But I, I, you know, that was my pick. All right. What, what do you got, Fry? Well, I, I was going to go into the TV realm since we seem to spend a lot of our time in movies. Um, and I was going to talk about the Lone Gunman. Hells, yes. From, you know, X Files and the Lone Gunman. Insert X Files <laughs> intro music here. Do, 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 ding, ding. <laughs> so th- I don't if I remember do you want to believe Lance oh I do yeah I don't believe but I want to believe there's a difference um yeah that, I don't know I, I could be mistaken because it's been a while since I've marathoned through the series I don't know if they show up in the first season but it, it, they became regulars like the moment they're introduced they show up at least once a season and there's always some scenario where you need them to hack into something or find some information out. You know, they're they're basically just this weird kind of mercenary, free, inf- you know, free information kind of thing. Kind of like the National Enquirer, only it's not bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and 
quite frequently they step up, especially in the last season of the original run, uh, season nine. They step they step up tremendously and ended up sacrificing themselves for uh, Agent Doggett and Scully, um, and basically dying of radiation um, when they stopped this reactor from going off. So you know they're they're kind of overshadowed because they're the goofy ones. Every time they show up, it's kind of a goofy episode, but. I, you know, for for as much crap as they got, especially with their own TV show, I I think they deserve a little mention. You know, they're they're better than uh, I can't remember her name, but it was like Agent Doggett's partner. After a while, after Scully kind of fucked off and did her own thing. Oh yeah, uh, dang. I, I remember the actress was like Anna something, but that character almost never came back around that really takes me back <laughs> i don't remember the name either yeah ah, crap that's gonna, oh well that's gonna bug it's, me a, it's the same actress that was in steel which you know if we ever want to talk about bad movies that i like that no one else <laughs> likes <laughs> <laughs> wait doesn't that happen pretty frequently uh, honestly yeah, most movies at I least know. when we're off air <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so i think we'll pass this one back over to the boss man. Boss man. And I got Wang. Uh, Wang. Nobody wants to hear about your Wang. <laughs> Wang's out. <laughs> Wang's, <laughs> Wang's out for Harambe. <laughs> oh, hey, well, we, we do live in Harambe's home uh, city here. Yeah, we do. Yes, the unsung hero of Big Trouble in Little China. Wang. Wang. <laughs> I don't like to say that, so we hear that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, Wang Chi. Rich to talk about Wang. <laughs> What? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> We're just having our own private conversation over here. With, with the listeners. The listeners with the will listeners. know. <laughs> <laughs> and I will hear this, and I will kick you square in the <laughs> Squat! Square in the wang! Squat in the wang! <laughs> <laughs> Come on, wang. What's going on? There's too all much right. weird shit going all, on. All right. Now we've got most dick jokes out of, out of the way. Uh, he most. really is the hero of the film. He's the only one who does anything. He does everything in the film. Everything. Everything. Jack Burton is kind. Besides we'll, we'll drawing money, there. Yeah. he's kind of useless. So he's the monologist. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll definitely talk about him in a sec. But yeah, Wang, Wang does all the action, all the fighting. Leads it, it's, everything. It's him, him and... Uh, sure, yeah. I can't remember the um, the other character. It's like Uncle... Uncle Cho or something. The the older guy who actually does the magic. It's basically Wang and the older guy are the only ones who do anything in the Egg movie. Shen? Egg Shen. Yeah. yeah. He's the only one who does anything. Yeah. The rest of the characters are just kind of there going... They're kind of backdrops, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's more like Keystone Cops whenever they're on screen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's really not much to say about him besides that he does everything in the movie. So if you've ever seen that movie, just watch it and pay attention because it's pretty obvious and i think that's like one of like two movies that actor did too he didn't get enough credit for that yeah okay he's the sidekick sidekick turned hero okay wang so. kicks sam wise's ass he can uh, certainly uh, kick that whiny could. bitch frodo's ass but can he kick rudy's ass <laughs> to be yes. fair though <laughs> everyone can kick rudy's ass <laughs> to be fair ass. though wang actually rudy. has especially rudy. towards the end of rudy's career oh oh you guys are kind of going to end up with brian pick well Ooh, Edge. Brian's song reference. Edge. Mm. Damn. Amber. You want to follow that up? You want to follow that horrible joke up? Well, I was just going to bring up the best sidekick turned hero. Princess Bride, Inigo Montoya. Yep. Not only was the acting exceptional, the character's just awesome. He was also not prepared to die like Brian Piccolo. Oh! <laughs> back to it. In his big fight scene against the man with six fingers, he had just a few months prior lost his father in real life to cancer. Mm -hmm. And so the actor was getting all that emotion out in that scene. The, um, yeah, the man with six fingers was the cancer. Yep. Uh, quite quite literally, that's how he viewed him. It's, it's, Mandy it's, it's Pattinson. Pat yeah, it's insane. Pattinson, I think. Pattinson, yeah. Like, yeah, like all, all that emotion and everything in his face, it's it's just that's him. That's real. Yeah. Him that's channeling. him, not acting. It's just, that's what makes that scene so phenomenal and why we all connect with it so much. 
Yeah, there's there's a lot of scenes in movies like that where real life tragedy kind of bleeds through. Um, kind of, a you know, she's a hero as well. And, you know, we might touch on it in a little bit quickly. Um, Ripley from Aliens. Oh, yeah. In, in the director's cut of Aliens, there's a scene where um, Paul Reiser's character shows her a picture of her dead daughter and she's all old. Well, apparently that was actually a picture of Sigourney Weaver's mother who died like a week before they started filming. I did not know that. So wow. when she's crying and like touching the picture, it, it's because she she still wasn't over it. So the same thing with uh, the Inigo Montoya thing. It's like sometimes you just take that personal tragedy and just push it into mm-hmm. the movie and it makes it memorable. Everyone remembers that whole thing. Yeah. I mean, I actually remember more of... Anigo's scenes than I do of uh, Carrie Ewell's. That's yeah. because Carrie was always just laying around being sick and injured. Well, because he had broken his leg before they started although, filming. <laughs> although, <laughs> so although he does become mine and Amber's favorite villain in another series. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, we'll mention that. He's pretty useless in uh, Princess Bride and Saw. But no, I wasn't talking about Saw. He's not a villain in Saw. He, he is at the end. <laughs> he watched the whole series. He becomes a villain in, uh, what, was it Psych? No. What what was it, babe? That Carriols is the uh, the master art thief. I think it's Psych. No, the I librarians? thought it was in, yeah, it was in Psych. Yeah. yeah. No, it's in Psych. He's uh he makes several episode appearances in Psych. He's an international art thief and he like pops in and out <laughs> of the guy's lives and uh it's, it's pretty fabulous it's pretty awesome Ooh, he's carrie francisco or something <laughs> <laughs> he's basically lupon the third uh, oh well okay yeah <laughs> lupon the third <laughs> <laughs> right. which you could argue that uh goemon is basically the the sidekick who picks up all of lupon's shit because lupon's just a mischievous yeah. bastard <laughs> <He's> like, yeah, <laughs> i mean he is a mastermind he, he, but he's kind of a fuck up he's and not just kind useless. of in for the fun yeah, yeah. <laughs> but going on picks up all his shit <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> so there you go um now if if you didn't get enough of that wang talk i think <laughs> i think rich wants to get back around to some wang you know some jack wang <laughs> action oh jack burton <laughs> i don't know what the fuck you're talking about <laughs> Well, our, our next portion. Well, our next portion. Yeah, our, our celebrity uh, couple, Jack Wang. <laughs> Wang Jack. <laughs> Wang Jack. All right, so we'll, we'll shift gears to the non-heroes. <laughs> oh, yeah. So these are basically any of the heroes <laughs> that they're always in the wrong place at the wrong time. They rarely drive the story. And if they basically even raise a finger, everything goes wrong. Or they sometimes make the situation worse. Oh, yeah. Most times yeah. make the situation worse. Exhibit A, Jack Burton. Bum, bum, bum. He doesn't do shit. <laughs> he, he does one narrator. He does one thing in the whole movie he, no, that's he worth does a damn. Two things. Not in the movie. One in the movie. Yeah, one in the he's movie. He's the narrator. Second of all, he's it has Kurt, it's Kurt Russell's face, so he's selling tickets. Well, that's it. In, in the movie universe, does. in the movie universe, he does get the last blow because he catches the knife and throws it back at Lopan's head. That is the only contribution yeah. to the whole movie that's worth a damn. Yep. I, yeah, I could. I and could. he sold a lot of those tank tops. <laughs> that's true. My, so, da- my dad had one of those <laughs> Chinatown tank so tops. What shirts. we learned is <laughs> those things were everywhere. He is a merch machine. <laughs> And a destroyer of sorcerers, and that's it. Well, that's that's why Disney liked Kurt Russell so much. He was a merch machine. He saw Kurt Russell's potential decades before anyone else did. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah, you know, there's not much else to say about it. They're, he, he's cocky. Jack are kind of very simple examples. That we can yeah, they're, they're friends, but it's... Jack's just cocky. He's, he's there. He thinks very highly of himself. But... but but Fry, yes. only dicks get cocky. Yeah. <laughs> but let's be real. It was the 80s. You needed a white guy fronting your Asian movie. You really Listen, you that, did. that joke you did. comes up a Damn, lot. I mean, way. that's the reality. It, it, yeah. it kind of is. Because yeah. if that movie would come out now, there'd be a lot of complaints of whitewashing. And, you know, why is <laughs> Kurt Russell running around Chinatown? But... <laughs> It is what it is. It, it's of a different era. Yeah, different era. I mean. yeah. And it in the movie fucking rocks. If you it's haven't amazing. if you haven't seen it, it's amazing. Um, a lot of the puppetry and the claymation 
movie's just damn good. And it's yeah. it's it was a financial failure. It was a critical failure at the time. Not until years later. So more, you know, really recently, it's got it's all the reruns. Of, yeah, it, that it has a resurgence gave it life. of popularity, which is interesting. It, it's just it was too weird for the time. Yeah, it really was. But that's John Carpenter for you. He, he's either starting a new trend with like Halloween and stuff like that, or he's so far ahead of the curve on things like that or the thing, and they just flop because yep. the audience isn't ready. Yep, but he's truth. Too- He's consistently too far ahead of his time. He speak the truth. The truth. He speak the true true. <laughs> well, speaking of men in the future. <laughs> yeah. Daniel Jackson. Yep. Dr. Daniel Jackson. I'm sorry. From Stargate. Um, and purely just the movie. Um, I, you got to be honest. If you watch the first Stargate movie, he doesn't do a damn thing. Um. He, he does help them open the gate. whoop de freaking do But he's so overconfident in his abilities, much like Jack, that he just makes the situation worse. He's like, oh, yeah, 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 I can translate the other gate. Gets this entire military team stranded. In the movie, it's actually across the universe, not just the galaxy. There's some inconsistencies between the movie and the show. And every time he does something, he makes it worse. You know, they're... Stuck on a planet. Okay, well, what's the next thing he he does? Okay, well, he gets drug off by this animal and discovered by the indigenous people, but he's wearing that stupid rod necklace. So then they think he's a god. Well, then their god shows up and punishes everybody because he's posing as their god. And every, everything he does in that movie, he's just, he, he's a fuck up. Um, he, he's, a, he's the nerdy guy. He's, you're, he's supposed to be the audience. He's the everyman, but... Let's be honest. He's the probably the worst character in that movie. <laughs> and who and who picks up the slack in that movie? Kurt Russell. Do you see a theme here? <laughs> so he was useful from one movie. Now he's useful in this one. Yeah, he's suicidal, but he's useful. He'll blow up a nuke just to save her. Talking about suicidal, but useful. Yeah, <laughs> Riggs. <laughs> oh yeah. So. Yeah. But he's not a non-hero. He's a, he's a total hero. <laughs> yeah, and he's a batshit crazy hero. <laughs> but yeah, it's it, it's a character I really like, and I love that franchise. But until the series, he's not useful. You know, he he gets stuck in he gets himself and everybody else stuck in that situation. Yeah, I mean, I can agree with that. That's that's a pretty good way to put it. I mean, another hero on the other side of the galaxy. Far, far away. Far, far, far away. That's introduced in the new trilogy. Now, I just want to preface this with, I love the character. I love the actor. But he was so useless. In eight. And I am talking about, of course, Finn. Yeah, Yeah, in eight. What does he do? He just bumbles about from scene to scene like, how did I get here? What is my name? <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, she's not far off. I mean, basically, he's has a purpose in one. Or seven, sorry. Yeah, however you want to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> Episode seven, he's, you know, Stormtrooper, kind of pussies out, doesn't want to do that anymore. I mean, and and he his, runs away from his job. He runs away from his job. Well, that's, that's not and, a good work ethic. And because well, he he's interacts... Also murdering people. They're also murdering people, so he doesn't want to do that. Still, yeah. And because he interacts not, with Ray, it kind of kicks off that story, but yeah. then his kind of usefulness ends. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he steps up. Like, I, I just yeah, don't think they tra- know what to do with him. He, he tries. Well, no, he steps up against Traitor. Um... The guy that with the yeah, who well, but in se- got still the in seven Chewbacca bow to the chest. Yep, yeah, still seven. He also uh, that's what I'm saying. In seven, he's kind of useful, um, to yeah. a degree. The moment he gets slashed in the back, yeah, his whole usefulness eight, goes yeah. out the window. But yeah. what is he doing to drive the story forward? Of eight, nothing. Uh, yeah, it's eight. Absolutely. Set seven, he kind of does. He yeah. he does. And that's what I'm trying to show is the shift from, okay, seven, he's totally something different, but then eight, up until now. So I'm hoping that his character gets a little redemption arc of usefulness. But until then, 
It is what it is, and we shall just bumble along with it. There, there'll, there'll have to be some damage control done in yeah. nine. Yeah. Because what did he do in eight? He went to a casino planet, freed some animals, <laughs> like a bunch of hippies, and then <laughs> they got thrown in jail because they're shitty criminals. And then they I mean, trusted the one, the one guy in jail. Like, yeah, we'll totally trust this guy. Then he sells him out to the Empire. Or the Forced Order, sorry. I just realized, uh, I don't know if you're talking about difference? my D&D character or if we're talking about Finn still. Yes. <laughs> yes. It really does sound like so, your D&D character. <laughs> I didn't realize I'm playing Finn. Oh. Whoops. <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> Gotta fix that. FN218 Salmon. <laughs> um, but speaking of useless heroes, Lance. Oh, man. Okay. I. You have the whopper. This This triggers me every time I think about it. Quite this honestly, this is kind of this is Lance's version of my Amy Dunn, <laughs> it, my Joker. I can rant on this for a while. Bastion Bucks from the Neverending Story. This kid, I, okay. First off, he's getting bullied. Right, he runs back into his school, gets locked in to this uh, to this thing, finds the the Neverending Story book, starts reading it, and begins basically the terror and tribulation for Atreyu, mm. who's like running through trying to do all this stuff. Bastion is not a hero. He is a kid reading a book and that book is coming to life. But yet at the end of the movie, he gets all of the credit simply for screaming out a name into the wind for mm -hmm. the childlike empress. Meanwhile, Atreyu is off running, you know, doing all of these things. And it, it, Segues into the tragic hero, but we'll get to that. But for right now, Bastion is the most useless person who's credited as being a hero. And it just drives me absolutely nuts. Mm -hmm. At the end of the movie, they're like, he's riding on Falcor through the wind. He's the one hanging out with all of the people from the storybook. <laughs> he's the one that gets all the glory. And all he did was sit there and cry like a little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> So what you're saying is we could we could have traded out Bastion for Frodo in this story. It would have been the same outcome. It's pretty much, yeah, the correlations are there. Oh, God, I could just go on that one forever. But I won't. Anyway. Well, it sounds like you that was a traumatic childhood growing up with that <laughs> shitty hero. What? No, so I watched the hell out of that movie, right? And, I mean, okay, so... Lance. This we, is the segue. Yeah, this is the segue. So we'll we'll go into the tragic hero part. So this is where Atreyu, right, is actually the hero. He's the one fighting yeah. Gamorg. He's the one that finds Morla in the Swamp of Sorrows. He's the one who loses Artax on his way through the Swamp of Sorrows. It's just like all of this crap that he goes through. He's actually doing the heroic stuff mm -hmm. and gets zero fucking credit for it because it's so, just words on a page um, man yeah he and and so you know the the tragic hero they start with the best of intentions but everything goes wrong by the end um usually resulting in their death or horrible pain i can literally think of nobody better for that than atreyu and it's all because bastions in the freaking bell tower Real. reading this <laughs> damn book that's bringing all this stuff to, to life and it's causing the nothing and ah uh, just, I could rant on this forever, but I won't. Somebody Aww. else, somebody else go. <laughs> now I'm, now I'm, now, salty. now we want to see salty. rage. I'm salty, dude. I don't think you understand. <laughs> no, I understand. I, 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 I revel in it. Yes. He's almost as salty as McDonald's fries. <laughs> so, yeah. Hold on, 1980s McDonald's fries or today fries? Oh, yeah. <sighs> I don't know which one was saltier. Oh. <laughs> now is saltier to mask the fact that the flavor is awful. Mm. Mm. Sorry. Like a wet there. noodle of potatoes. Soggy <laughs> potatoes. We're never getting sponsored by McDonald's. <laughs> I'm okay with this. I'm, I'm good with that. So, uh, because I just merely rent that food. <laughs> uh, that's Taco Bell for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the food that you love to eat and then you hate yourself for having eaten it later. You're no, like uh, McDonald's I never hate going again. in and out. <laughs> I do it out of necessity. I don't know. Sometimes it's that's good. The, that's it's my good. tragic McDonald's story. Just as you do you know who else is almost as tragic as McDonald's going in and out of me? Who's that? Spider Man. Oh shit. Son. Why? Because Spider Man is kind alright. Not a complete fuck up. 
but he's destined to be fucked over by everyone who gets close to him. Yeah, ends up hurt in some Uncle way, shape, ben, or form. Dead. Aunt May captured. Multiple comics, movies, doesn't matter. At least yep. Uncle Ben founded a race company first. <laughs> <laughs> That's the wrong Uncle Ben. At least he figured out how to not have to deal with all the stress. I just couldn't resist. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> ha! Trust him. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Rich. All right, Giggles. <laughs> So, all right, he founded his rice company and then gets shot. And then we get we have Aunt May, who is basically the damsel in distress for Peter. And the yeah. for a big, for a and, big portion. And Mary Jane, his, fr- his first girlfriend, girlfriend Gwen Stacy, is dead. Killed by him, technically. By him. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he snaps her back and kills yeah. her. Uh, who, who else does he fuck over? Well, te- technically, Mary Jane does get fucked over later because when they're married, it starts taking a toll on their marriage and they end up. Breaking up, getting yeah. back together, breaking up all the time. Um, I think they're separated again in the comics now. I, they I can't got married remember. again. I, I, yeah, they got I, married I, again. I then I think they broke up yeah. again when he started Parker Industries. I can't keep but track. Yeah, like, he's a hero. <laughs> he puts bad guys away, but at the same time, he's forever cursed. Marvel likes to make it so that none of the heroes can ever have a successful relationship. The most With successful relationship is probably Mr. Fantastic and the That's Invisible right. Woman. They, they, Sue, Sue Storm and Mr. Fantastic. Yeah, they keep... They but keep, they still argue. They keep reiterating time and again, okay, if you're a superhero, you cannot possibly have a relationship because as soon as you're beholden to somebody else, they're, you know, the villains are going to use that against you. Yeah, so, but Spider-Man, it doesn't matter what what he does. But anybody near. Probably all the time. <laughs> Just watch the next movie. I'm calling it. Ned's going to get captured or beaten to a pulp. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see that. that. I mean, he's going to learn a lesson not to trust people, I think, in mm-hmm. this one. So, mm-hmm. yeah, Spider Man is just forever cursed to be the nice guy that could be the ass by it. Speaking about being cursed to be the nice guy, Fry. <laughs> what? Are you trying to segue? <laughs> yeah, a little bit of a segue. Are you trying to segue? I mean, if Mr. there's anybody Potter? that's ever been put in the friend zone, oh, he, oh fuck, the man. ultimate yeah. friend it zone. Was that's definitely, it, and it hurts. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about Severus so Snape. Sad. <laughs> that it really is. His whole story is friend zoning. He he absolutely loves Lily so much. He, he's like fallen her like a little puppy her whole life. Um. She falls in love with James, who's an outright dick. The cocky asshole. Um, and even though he hates James so much, he kind of hates Harry too. But he, he, in order to honor Lily's memory, he's protecting Harry, and at the same time knows what's coming. Because um, there's a lot of the uh, scenes in the movie and then in the book where Dumbledore's kind of explaining his grand plans. It's you're we're offering this kid up for slaughter. Yeah. And it's your job to train him to basically just survive long enough so, for him to die at the end. Uh-huh. And that's it. And it's killing him because, you know, he, he, he has the same charm as Lily, if I remember. Um, and he, he, he wants to honor her, but in the end, because he's now, you know, a triple agent or quadruple agent by the end, he dies. And he he dies, he kills Dumbledore before this, knowing that Harry's going to hate him forever. Yeah. And it's only as he's dying that he reveals, you know, I was kind of doing this all for you. Sorry that I'm fucking up your life and killing the people you know, but here you can have some of my tears. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's... That is a really good really good tragic hero you know yeah. if, you, if you think about it harry is along for the ride for a lot of that series you know he does some of the small things usually at the end of each book but it's like dumbledore and snape and all these people behind the scenes they're actually guiding him towards that final conflict with mm-hmm. Dumbledore. it's i mean it still takes harry like bravely bumbling time. into crap yeah it but... does you know, at least he's not as useless as Jack Burton. <laughs> yeah. No, no. No. Harry does stuff, yeah. And, and, but that that had to have killed him, you know, basically knowing... Because he was a Death Eater. 
It's like mm-hmm. you're going to be. And then it, it's lit when he's caught and then goes double agent for Dumbledore and all that, knowing what's coming for Lily and James. That his whole life is nothing but pain. <laughs> yeah. It sucks. Yeah. Speaking of <laughs> whole life being nothing but pain. It's the most depressing musical work. Miss Amber. So it's a little outside our nerd herd wheelhouse, but... I don't think it's outside it at all. It's just a different type of nerd. Um, well, I'm still in this one. Um, but Javert from Les Mis. Girl watching a hell out of that, too. Mm-hmm. Love it. And I do love Russell Crowe's singing, so you guys can all just fuck right off about that. It's, it's considered I've never by... I've seen this movie. Yeah, so it's considered by most that Russell Crowe was like the worst part of that movie. I thought he was fine. He did a great job with the it, role. It's, and- it's how they did the singing in that movie where it's all on stage and live that, yeah, it's probably not the best he could do. It was also, it, I think, probably not the right way to go about recording all the singing. No. It, it should have been recorded in the I studio. thought there was something yeah. about that that was neat, like... I think you know, it was, it was more like, in the moment. Exactly. I think it was good for Anne Hathaway's character for her scenes, but I think there were a else few of them that, that did really well with it. His maybe would have done better in a studio setting, but you know he's also playing this very serious character, very so serious, he's not going to have raw character, a very belty voice or anything that is. Well, he's is, a very stoic character. He's exactly, just trying to do his job, be a good police officer, do right by the law, but. You know, not everything in life is black and white, and he can't, he's so lawful good, he can't see how to adapt to this gray area that is now that John sounds, John. That sounds like my D&D character. <laughs> <laughs> my D&D character was so lawful good, he couldn't see past his own uh, righteousness. Yeah. <laughs> but, so he's just so focused on, you know... Um, Jean Valjean becomes his white whale and he's got to get him in jail where he belongs and all Jean Valjean wants to do is live a quiet life making a little town nice and successful Mm -hmm. Um, and raising this girl so it's just sad because his character is such a good wholesome character at the beginning and he just spirals spirals until he jumps off the dam yeah yeah, he, he really didn't need to. That's another one where it's like his death didn't need to happen. Mm-hmm. wasn't wasn't necessary. Nothing was gained by it. It no. didn't solve anything. It didn't help anything. Yes, but nothing ventured, nothing gained. All they needed to do was sit down and have some coffee and talk. What? Who? Who talks about things these days, though? I mean, everybody's. I like it's all action or nothing. Seventeen fifties. They yeah. couldn't talk. They had time. They weren't going to go watch any movies. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, it was 1790s, wasn't it? I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I think the French. Yeah, the French Revolution was 1790 something. Could be wrong, but you know. Actually, the movie does start earlier. Um, the movie does start earlier because that's when when uh, Hugh Jackman's character is put in the prison. Well, the at, storming of the Bastille was 1789. Okay. So, yeah, we're we're saying okay. All right. The, the, okay. the only reason I was even close on the dates is because of Assassin's Creed. I gotta be honest. <laughs> the principal events of Les Mis are 1832. So, okay. I don't know. They're covering a lot of time periods, apparently. It's a very... It's basically uh, but when you're, Jean Valjean's whole life story. It's just these other characters that are happening When you're covering 1,200 pages of story, mm-hmm. there's a lot of time to cover in and, that. There's already another version in the works. Yay! Yay! Because I can't leave the damn movie alone. <laughs> <laughs> but is it going to be a singing version or a boring talking version? I think it's another singing it one. It better be. Yeah, the the, the talky talky one was boring. I wanted to like it so bad because of the actors in it, too. And mm-hmm. I That's the one with Barbosa, right? The talky talk? I th- yeah. think yeah. so. And I think yeah. that um, Liam Neeson was in it, too. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Everything goes back to Liam Neeson. I thought it was Kevin Bacon. Yeah, it's like but, you six know, degrees of Kevin Bacon. Oh, they're doing a TV miniseries. That's what it. Okay, that's what it yeah. is. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know about this. Ooh. <laughs> Who's airing this miniseries? Uh, Probably PBS. They need that Downton to Abbey money. <laughs> I can't find it. IMDb, you're okay. failing me. Looks like Lily Collins in it. Ooh, I like Lily Collins. She is a fun team. Cool. I might, might watch it then. 
BBC is doing it. Ooh, I'm excited. Sounds like we may already have a future episode. Hey guys, we're good. Well, BBC is doing it. I'm sure. Uh, what's her name? Tatiana Maisley should still be under contract for something. Show up in it. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? One, anyway, one could hope. Well, now we're getting into uh, the good oh, stuff. Hold on, real, 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 real oh. quick. Hold on, hold on. The TV miniseries. Do you guys remember the guy from Black Mirror who was in the episode with the bicycles and they had to power all the shit? I remember yeah. that. Yeah, the first he, episode. He's <laughs> Javert. Oh, okay. Oh, that wasn't the first episode. That was the the second first episode, episode. Was, sure. was the one where they make the politicians grow a pig. Oh, right. Right. Yeah, I, I try to. In my that world, one. it's the first yeah. Everybody episode. forgets that one. <laughs> <laughs> Disturbing. <laughs> that one almost made me go. No, nah, I'm okay without this series. Yep. And then somebody else was like, "No, seriously, just go watch the second just one. Keep going." And like it's yeah, because that one had the song that they constantly play throughout the series. Yes. Yeah, I can't remember it anymore. But <laughs> yep. All right, moving on. To moving the... on to the badass motherfuckers. To the bad bad boys. <laughs> I'm the hero. With the wallet that says bad motherfucker on it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear about the guy that actually had that wallet? Oh, really? He So there was a guy that had that wallet, and I guess he was in, like, a stick-up or something like that, and the guy had, like, grabbed his wallet and looked at it and was like, um, you can have this back. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably like, that's what I thought, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> he even talked about it later. He's like, yeah. He's like, I never had I been so happy that I had a, a fandom Mm. <laughs> and, and yeah, because if, if someone robs you and they don't know what it's from, they're probably... <laughs> they're like, uh -oh. oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, okay, yeah, so... Yeah. So what's this topic about? It's bad boys. It's about... It's bad boys. They buck the convention and rarely mm. adhere to the rules mm -hmm. and even the law sometimes. Mm -hmm. But in the end, they save the day. Mm -hmm. we've, we've got quite a list, I think, for these. Uh, well, pick one and start us off there, Lance. <sighs> I mean, <laughs> okay, um, Corbin Dallas. Really? Yeah. Corbin! Corbin! Corbin, my man! <laughs> Corbin! <laughs> I, ain't got, I ain't got no fire, Corbin! What's the word of the day? <laughs> I. Or whatever it was. <laughs> Riveting! Or thrilled. Or thrilled. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> what's the word of the day? Thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so no, so uh, here's this dude in you know, the great future beyond. And he's just going through his life. He's like, all right, I'm a taxi driver. I've settled down. I'm, I'm doing my thing. And all of a sudden, you know, everything goes to shit for him. He's like, damn it. I just lo used the last points on my license. Come mm -hmm. on. <laughs> he's a taxi driver in the same universe as Valerian. Yes. If you did not know that. Yes. Or, well, Valerian inspired the fifth element, so. Yeah, yeah it's all like that. It's, it's, it's a loop. It's a weird loop. Yeah. yeah. Um, Total bad. So he goes through and just is completely taking control of the situations, even though he doesn't want to. He, like, mm -hmm. keeps, he keeps trying to walk out of it, and he's like, I don't really want to be here. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. And yeah, because like, he's ex-military, but he's, like you said, he's working as a taxi driver. He yeah. doesn't want to do this shit anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets roped into it and finally goes, all right, fine. If I'm, if I'm doing it, Do you remember the name of the contest? The Flossed in Paradise. Uh, yeah, you're always there. Lost in Paradise Gemini Cricket Contest. Yes! <laughs> 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 I still remember it. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't remember the singer's name, by the way. That's the only thing. Flava Laguna. Yeah, I can never remember that. Oh, dude, she was so awesome. And the director's then wife, soon to be ex-wife. Aww. But that's kind of her M.O. <laughs> not her. No, that's not her M.O. They got married when she was like, or they were together when she was like 15. Hmm. That was his M.O. What the fuck? Well, she, Yeah. No, she was just like the innocent, soon to be ex wife while Mila Jovovich is like, hey, look at me in my little bondage suit. Yeah, so, that's true. Yeah. But I think she, she ended up marrying uh, Paul Anderson too when she was doing Resident Evil. So she has, she kind of has an MO. Thing. Yeah. 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 Same thing with uh, Kate Beckinsale. She, she likes marrying her directors too, apparently. Apparently, when you spend that much time on set with them, I guess, you know. Yeah. 
it, it happens. They must have like those because you have the same schedule. Well, they must have those submissive sides to them too, because the director is like ordering them around. Do this, do that, act this way. And those girls are like, okay. Because <laughs> yeah. that was, I, we just got into something dark. On, on a side tangent, because we love doing tangents around here. I think Fifth Element was the second English speaking movie Mila did. Oh really? I think so. Because yeah. uh, oh, I can't think of it. It's it's uh, some high high school. It's the movie with uh, Matthew McConaughey where he does the all right, all right, all right. Her first feature film was Two Men Junction, mm, or the Return to Blue Lagoon. Oh, uh, it might. Have, yeah, Blue. La- yeah, Return to Blue Lagoon might have been her first English speaking one. And then there's there's another one. You yeah. With Matthew McConaughey, and then she did Fifth Element because her accent in that still in Fifth Element still very heavy. Mm-hmm. So. She's funny you mention her because she is also a badass hero. Yeah, in all but one of those movies, I know what you're talking about. Oh yeah, yeah. Let's go. She's uh, she's my badass hero because mm-hmm. you know bad boy heroes got to have Mila in here. Oh yeah. So I have her from Resident Evil as Alice because mm-hmm. she was a badass. Totally and was. All but the first one. Yes. My favorite though is and I'm Except probably gonna get ending. shit on for this, but my favorite Resident Evil is Nemesis. Apocalypse. Apocalypse. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. The one where one. they fight Nemesis. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, the second one, which that's most one people will disagree that that's one of the worst ones. I I agree I with you. I, I thought, thought chapter. You were. <laughs> I really thought Fry was going to be the one to poop on me. No, yeah, no, no. Apocalypse it's not supposed to be the worst movie. Apocalypse is easily the best of the Resident Evil movies because it's the closest <laughs> yeah. to the game. Yeah. yeah. So, I don't even know the games. I just love that movie. The no, first, it's, it's the closest. It's kind of like yeah. two, then one, then three, and then it, it kind of goes in order of reels. crap after yeah. that. Right. But, it just gets worse. But every movie that Mila's in, she just, she kicks ass. Oh yeah, she gives She's it her so all. so good. Because I even, I had even made a comment when they were coming out with the final chapter. I'm like, I had to look up her age when they were filming. I'm like, aren't you getting a little old to be doing these? Aren't you, shouldn't you be slowing down? And it's like, oh, no, no, you're still okay. I, I guess you can still kick ass. I, I just <laughs> I'm not going to question it. She probably, she probably killed me. I just feel really <laughs> bad for a stunt woman in the final chapter. Yeah, that was kind of a shit But her situation. Instagram is really inspiring. Yeah. Uh, situation. Yeah, the her yeah. Uh, stunt driver on the motorcycle got paralyzed in the last um, movie. Oh, no, oh, no, 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 she didn't get paralyzed. No, Ooh. she got... No, this is what happened. All right, she was. It, it was the motorcycle scene of Final Chapter. Yeah. So didn't, didn't she get paralyzed? No, like one of her legs. Still, she, had, she lost her arm. Yeah. That's okay. That's what it was. I the, I, I thought she lost the a boom leg with the camera on it. Didn't lift up like it was supposed to. So she's going like 80, 90 miles an hour. Hits it. It the gloves her face. She loses her arm. Punctures a few ribs. I mean. Right. And her punctures a log with a few. See, I knew she lost a limb. Uh, I thought she had lost a leg. No, because no, she's, she's getting back into like fight training mm-hmm. and like she's doing a lot of work, but mm. her spine is twisted now. Yeah. Ooh. Um, that sucks. But she's. But it it is actively, a badass scene in the movie. You know, but that, yeah, her arm shriveled until ooh. they finally got rid of it. Yeah, because it's Rich, like Rich said. You know, I won't fight it too much. That last Resident Evil movie is not the greatest. But man, it's got some damn good action. She was also <laughs> some good scenes, but overall, it's like what the fuck are she was doing? Also <laughs> it's all the over the place. Stunt woman from um, uh, Mad Max Fury Mad Mad Road. Mad Max, she was Fur- Furiosa's. Stunt. So a little bit of uh, foreshadowing mm-hmm. there. Mm. The, little oh, yeah. the universe has spoken. Probably. Lose your heart. No, but her Instagram's really inspiring. The yeah. stunt double. Well, do you know who else is inspiring in real life? Being a sh- you know piece of shit in real life to. Being a hero, on and off the screen. Yep. Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> yeah. Who R. plays R. Robert Downey Jr.? <laughs> Who plays Robert Downey Jr.? Basically, aka Tony Stark. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, for for years Hollywood wouldn't touch him. No, because it was he went through. It was like three or four phases of Hollywood where when he when he was up and coming, you know, he he was a young darling and. Then, then he got sent to rehab once, and it's like, okay, everyone's allowed one. Then he came back, and he did it again, and I feel like he did it even again after that. It's No one wanted to touch him. He was a drunk. Well, he wasn't reliable for working. Yeah, he was a drunk. He was a cokehead. He you was a womanizer. You if you can at least do your job. Yeah. So how do you, how do you get back 
some of your mojo, well, you know, you take on a role as yourself. <laughs> you kick off the Marvel Cinematic World. <sighs> yeah. Rich, we're all overshadowing you. Sorry. Yes. This is your topic. It's me. Please topic. tell us about I'm Robert Downey Jr. from the start. Him. I mean, he's a badass. He he basically goes for art. Right, he's a badass billionaire with a shitload of weapons and a shitload of money. What's it's already badass. How do you make it more badass? You get captured by terrorists in a cave. You almost die. Then you jerry rig a suit out of scrap metal mm. and then, you know kill all them. Blow you know blow the doors off off the root off the place and basically get rescued and start forming a superhero coalition. Pretty much undercover organization. Pretty fucking badass. Yeah, because everything up to that point in time, you know. Forget, obviously, they had a retcon things in the MCU, but up, if you think about it in universe, all superheroes had really been kind of kept undercover in the yep. MCU up to that point. And then here's this guy who even Shield has said in that final speech, just stick to the cards and read the script. You'll be fine. We're going to keep this undercover. And I am Iron Man. It, it's fucking. It, it's Robert yeah. Downey Jr. Apparently that wasn't scripted. He was supposed to just read the cards and then like I guess he'd he'd be outed in the second movie. But it was Robert Downey Jr.'s like <laughs> That's no. not what he would do. No, that's, that's not, not what he would do. He's like he's like, so I've heard you know, there's there's been some rumors. I've been hearing some rumors and he's like, Yeah, I'm Iron Man. <laughs> yeah. Because he because like you said, he's playing himself. How how what would Robert Downey Jr. do? roll over for a government organization? Fuck. No, he would totally just be like, bitch, I'm this. But he own it. <laughs> Do you with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, every, everyone knows Tony. and Which sets off the whole Obadiah Stane, you know, yeah. going this after him. Iron Man? Yeah. Iron Monger. <laughs> Roll Iron Mongers, Tony. <laughs> the shitty Iron Giant. <laughs> Basically, what he is. Yeah. The shitty Iron Giant. Well, that's okay because the Iron Giant comes into the MCU later just as a giant tree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, yeah, it's I all see connected. What, I see what you did there. <laughs> it's all connected. All the Hollywood okay. is just weird. It's, it's all connected. connected. Hollywood is very incestuous. <laughs> all right. Hey, we don't need to go down a Woody Allen tangent here. <laughs> <laughs> low, jab, low jab, low jab. <laughs> low hanging fruit. Yeah, we have gone so off topic. All right, who else do we need to talk about? Oh, we need to talk about kind of the... I, I wouldn't say he's the original bad boy, but he kind of is. We got we to gotta talk about uh, Detective Harry Callahan. Hell yes. Dirty Harry. shocked and appalled by a clip that I saw one day recently from a dare, Dirty Harry movie. What? Really? Do you remember when we were at uh, <laughs> really? the barcade, honey? Was that Dirty Harry? That was Dirty Harry. Oof. When the lady's in the back of the taxi cab and her pimp is yep. like, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep, yep, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I was not familiar with the Dirty Harry universe. Yep. And no, that was the first there's... first glimpse I got of it. I think it's like, because I only ever watched it on TV to begin with, so and I wasn't cut, pretty to all of that. a lot of that, that out. out. You know what else? The, the nerds, the Revenge of the Nerds. Is mm -hmm. the same way. Yep. Yeah. Like it's I were be a shit. I grew up watching it. And I'm like, oh, this is such a great movie. So when I'm I'm living in Nashville and I'm hanging out with my Christian friends and I'm like, hey, we should watch Revenge of the Nerds. It's on TV. It comes on and it's got all of the nudity scenes in it and all this other stuff. And me and these dudes are like sitting there like, uh oh, oh shit, this just <laughs> got uh -oh. weird. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, but no, Dirty Harry. Okay, he's it, it, as many people don't know because he's iconic for the whole. Magnum, shoot first, ask questions later. He kind of started that trend. Um, you know, there's that famous line of, you gotta ask yourself one question. Do do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Right. You know, it, it's iconic, but most people nowadays have never actually sat down and watched them. I don't even think I could name all five. I can name four of them, but I always forget one of them. Because mm -hmm. there's Dirty Harry, Magnum Force, The Enforcer, I don't remember the fourth movie. There's Deadpool. Deadpool's five, I think. Let's look Deadpool is either five I or four. That, I thought it was fifth one. Yeah, the fifth the fifth one, I'm not sure what it... All right. The fifth one might be called okay, Game of wait, Death. We got it. Dirty Harry, Magnum Force, The Enforcer, yep. Sudden Impact. Sudden Impact. There it Deadpool. is. Yep. 
and that's it as far as the movies. Yeah. But the first, as they got on later, it kind of reverted to its own tropes of he's a badass. He shoots first and then he's always getting partnered with women or like a minority or something to kind of soften him, especially for the audience. Well, yeah, because he has to learn how to deal with these people he's never dealt with before well, because he lived in his own creative yeah, world. In the, in the first movie, I don't think he has a partner in the first movie. I could be wrong. It's been a while since I've seen the first one. Um, but he is not a likable guy. So in the sequels, they tried making him more likable because he was a bankable name. But the first movie, the reason he's called Dirty Harry is not because he's a badass. The reason he's called Dirty Harry is he's a peeping Tom. He looks at women through their windows and he's a dirty old man. Yeah. And not, not a lot of people even know that that's the origin. Yeah, that's of his that name. name. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, they're just like, oh, well, he's a dirty cop. Or they no. thought, or they thought that he played dirty. Yeah, like okay, well, he's not a dirty cop. He's you know he is a law abiding dude, but he plays dirty. Like yeah. he's he's gonna play like the way that the it, bad it's guys just play. he started kind of the trend of the cops going outside the door to get the bad guy, and you know he'll he'll blow him away before you know taking him in for due process if he thinks this guy should die first. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's kind of his mo. Um, not really something that should have been kind of as proliferated as it should have been. It's the first movie is a hard, hard R, kind of that exploitation era. Absolutely. Kind of kind of in line with like Death Wish and some of those things like these were characters you weren't meant to idolize, but people did. Right. And a, a lot of it was originally written for shock factor. Mm -hmm. And then people started like kind of latching onto it later through the series. They started going back to the first one yeah, and, and, and in sequence going, wow, you know, this is really a awesome development of this and, character. And because we'll we, again, we love tangents. Well, I love tangents. We're going to go on a little tangent here um, because of that movie. My old boss used to be a police officer in Cincinnati. OK. And he, he obviously got injured in the line of duty and later became an engineer. But he talks about back in those days, Dirty Harry came out and it was this phenomenon. Well, the city council didn't like the fact that there were officers whose pistol was a 44 Magnum. That movie gave a bad name to the 44 Magnum. <laughs> and it was it was a good stopping round. It wasn't this like most powerful handgun known to man. It was powerful, but it wasn't the most powerful. Right. It gave such a bad name that I believe that's when they came out with the 41 Magnum for police officers to use, which was just horrible, horrible <laughs> PR campaign because the gun couldn't do shit. <laughs> I mean, I, I fired one and you don't even feel the thing going off. You know, you hear it, but it doesn't even recoil. <sighs> it's a pussy crown. <laughs> wow. So, I mean, that, that movie had an impact. I, a lot of movies do, for sure. Um, so so we kind of, Fry and I included this next little kind of thing in here. It's kind of a tongue-in-cheek. Yeah, You okay. kind of have to. Well, you know, it's a bad boy hero, so who are you going to put down? The, the bad boys. The bad boys. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Lowry and Marcus Burnett. Yeah, Mike Lowry and Marcus Burnett. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> bad boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's not too much to say. It's, you know, they're that whole movie is just a giant trope. Yeah, yeah. It, and that's what they were going for. Was it the one the one played by um uh Martin Lawrence? Martin Lawrence is uh, Marcus. He was kind of a, a smooth talking kind of like, you know, go with the flow kind of thing. It, it was Martin Lawrence, you know. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's a cheeky little bastard. He's, it, it, yeah. <laughs> so that uh, that brings us to our next category, the charmers, the smooth talking guys, charming heroes that introduce flair and charisma to every situation they encounter. Um, I got to go with uh, I got to go with mine from my childhood. Mr. Ferris Bueller. Hmm? Yeah, dude, he he taught those kids how to have a nice, enjoyable life and like not take anything for granted. Or did he? Or was it all Cameron? <laughs> that was Cameron. Dude, Cameron was such a stick in the mud until, well, but there's, until he threw his dad's car out the window. But there's the theory that <laughs> Ferris never existed and it was uh, Cameron's alternate personality taking over. Are you saying this is Fight Club? Could be. Yes. 
There, there is a fan theory out there. there. Yeah, there's. It, a it's lot a little. Of... There's a little inconsistency in it because it, some of it doesn't make sense, but could be. Yeah. I don't see Cameron convincing a restaurateur that he's Abe Froman. <laughs> the sausage king, <laughs> the sausage of, Chicago. king of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. That movie's classic. <laughs> <laughs> and it, well, it pulls in a bunch of tropes mm-hmm. as well, you know, and I think that's what is really cool about Ferris Bueller is that while there's, it pays homage to all these other great movies and everything like that. It was a great um, just kind of model of existence for for people my age that were like, oh, I have to be so serious in school. I have to be so serious about this. And then you you sit there and you go, well, no, I, I really don't. I think I just want to enjoy life and, and learn how to love who I am and, and what I'm doing um, more so than what everybody else tells me to love. Mm-hmm. Um, so other charmers, who do, who do we got? Uh, I mean, the doctor, but he, he, he always charms his companions. Okay. Unless he's Capaldi. We are. Ted, uh, Eccleson and Smith. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but you shed them out of order. That's going to make the nerds very angry. <laughs> It should be Eccleson, Tennant, and Smith. Smith. All right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Or we could go by hey. best rankings. <laughs> 10, 11, 9. No. <laughs> that doesn't match. Or 10. With was Friday. 10. Tenet was 10. Ten, okay. 11 was Smith and 9 was Eccleson. My personal favorite is Eccleson, but that's what got me reinvigorated. Um, I was going to say, there's about to be a fight up Tenet in the studio. Tenant is good. Tenant is very good. Smith is right out for me. I, I could no longer watch it when Smith got in. Was it because of Smith or the companions? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Chicken or the egg? Pond or Smith? 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 Smith started... Ra- I guess the fandom killed it for me for Smith because they just absolutely loved him. And I don't know. Anytime people latch on to something really ravidly, I just <clears> don't... I don't. I, I, I want to hate it. So I wanted to hate Matt Smith. Um, Amy Pond was just a North star. I don't like Karen Gillian until she appeared in Guardians. Now everything, we may have to fight. Everything she touched <laughs> was a steaming pile until she hit Guardians. I'm sorry. I mean, no. But that is more probably the direction than her. Yeah. Because she is a good actor. Hey, she agreed to be on that selfie show, and, and no one should forget about that. <laughs> but, I forgot about that now. And I won't forget that. about it because it's so horrible. <laughs> but the doctor could charm you into watching that show and enjoying it. Mm-hmm. Yes, he can. <laughs> Very much so. Taking it, taken from someone who has literally watched all of it, all of it that's available. Um, even one of my exes, her father had like beta taped or VHS, whatever tape we were watching on, like the original season. That's hard to come by. Like, there's a few episodes out there you can find. He didn't have all of it, but he had most of it. And it's like we started at the beginning. And watched all the way through to like the a movie that ended the franchise, and I'm like, "Fuck me, I don't want to watch any more of this." Hmm. And then Eccleson came in. I'm like, "Okay, this is cool. This is new." So yeah, he, he, he charmed me back in for a little bit. It's right. those old crusty white guys. I was saying it was because he was grumpy. <laughs> the grumpy old white guys kill the show. <laughs> I was saying Eccleston. Was, I uh, don't grumpy. mind Peter Capaldi. It's just Eccleston wasn't grumpy. Was number one he's, doctor. So here's a little note. He was thing. he was edgy, but he wasn't gr- he wasn't Capaldi grumpy. I yeah. had <laughs> I had never actually watched Doctor Who until I met Amber and her parents. Yay! Ooh, ever didn't even know what it was, and they were like, they, "Do you who, like Doctor who, who? who?" And I'm like, "Uh, the th- with the hit." I mean, you also <laughs> hadn't heard of Cincinnati Chili either. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get into that. That's, That's a story for a different. Your day. butt, your butthole wasn't prepared for the Cincinnati chili. <laughs> no, my my brain wasn't prepared for the for way the it was introduced to me. Anyway, That's a um, but uh, what about you, babe? How, who's your charmer? Well, I'm a girl, so obviously I have to go James Bond, Sean Connery, James Bond. I know you think he's a useless Bond, Fry. 
but no, I thought you didn't. I thought we had arguments about Sean Connery. No, Sean Connery is my second favorite. Okay. Um, Timothy Dalton. Oh, mm, fuck <laughs> I don't like Roger Moore. Roger Moore's the worst. Dang. Timothy Dalton's not very great. Like people, people. That's gonna draw some lines in people, the sand. People, yeah, Line people do drawn. not like Timothy Dalton, and they don't like George Lazenby. George only had like one as movie. A, yeah, 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 and people hate him for it. Um, That's not worth hating. As a kid, yeah, I didn't like George Lazenby's movie because it's more a casino. It, it's it's a slower burn. No, his is uh, Honor Majesty's okay. series. Who did Casino Royale? Craig. That no, the Daniel. original. The, ori- Royale. the original was a comedy, and it was yeah. Peter Sellers. Yeah. Yeah, and that movie's not a Bond movie, so it can fuck right off. If it's not EON Productions, it's not a Bond movie. So Never Say Never Again is not a Bond movie either. Uh, but I think Sean Connery really set the tone of what James Bond is. I think nobody ever talks about Brosnan. <laughs> Brosnan's my third. He's, really? He's okay. I'm okay. I do this a lot at work because I watch movies and TV shows at work. Periodically, I'll get tired of whatever show I'm watching. And I'll just watch Goldeneye. Like there, there have been times where my my friend Carrie will come over to my office and he'll look down. He's like, Jesus Christ, you're watching Goldeneye again? And yes. I'm like, Yeah, <laughs> dude. You know what? That was my favorite in '64 game. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm about to go to my third cartridge. I play that game so much I burnt out the the board. Oh my god! And my my second cartridge. Like if you look at my cartridge, Pierce Brosnan's face is like burning out because I play the game so much. <laughs> That's but funny. anyway, back back to the Sean. Yeah. I just I do find it funny how when a lot of people bring up their favorite Bonds, you never hear Pierce Brosnan's name come up. He's it's always he's, like, he's he's in the middle. He's he's, he's not bad. He's not polarizing in either direction. You're hearing the great or the shit. That's he, true. Yeah, yeah cuz Brosnan's just there. He just carried the timeline until we could get to Daniel. Yeah, cuz Goldeneye I would say is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow never dies is okay. World's not enough is okay. Die another day is garbage. So it kind of sets off golden eyes. So everyone just kind of goes, eh. <laughs> it, it is. It's just this middle. <laughs> he was there. <laughs> yeah. But people he, hate Timothy and people hate George. I hate Roger because he's campy. That's when I the series, the first Roger like more. two or three are actually really good. Because um, I just marathoned through the whole series again, like it, this past fall. Marathon through all of them in like a week. Um, they they do uh, bond marathons periodically yeah. on like TV and stuff like yeah. that. Yes, there's still TV. Um, <laughs> and I, yeah, usually middle of the more is when it gets real campy and stupid mm-hmm. because the producers start looking at what was popular, like Moonraker. Moonraker was not actually supposed to be in the time slot that it was. It came out as a response to Star Wars. And it is a campy, campy fucking movie. Yeah. Um, it's weird. but I feel like we kind of bonded to death here. So I was going to move us along to our last guy on our list. I don't remember who he technically is, but PETA from The Hunger Games. I don't know. I, I, I thought think, you picked I PETA. Think I might have been the one who chose him and defended him. I hate the character. I hate the actor. <laughs> I, I'm okay with the actor. I mean, he really hasn't done too much except Hunger Games and that uh, Future Man show. But he did charm the entire country. He charmed the country because he didn't want to die. <laughs> <laughs> it was basically uh, either I start smooching on this girl and put forth this love subplot that doesn't really exist... Well, in her mind, it doesn't exist. I guess he always did have a he crush on her. He always had a crush on her. Yeah. She needed to hook up with them. Yeah, and it was like, we okay. either both die or I kill her. You know, it was kind of... He's, yeah, he's yeah. there. And but, but he charmed the viewers, and he made things work. He made sure they got supplies when they needed it. And you, you can argue in uh, the third book in three and four movies, um, because he is the charmer, He's the one who uh, the capital kind of takes under their wing. You know, Katniss becomes the revolutionary and they kind of brainwash PETA. And he's now on their side for the first half of uh, which Mo- I, I Mocking guess, Jay. Yeah, which I guess you could probably go back and put Katniss in the badass category. Because she, but she, she, she totally took everything and turned it on its head and was like, she's, I'm she's doing kind it this of way. everything. Because that first one, it's yeah. kind of tragic. She's doing it out of necessity because she's saving her sister. 
She's reluctant. She doesn't she really want to do it. Her. Exactly. Yeah. But you know, she did spawn a whole generation of archers. You know, so, which is kind of cool. It is kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> we, I don't think we would have had the same style of reboot Tomb Raider without Katniss. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And homie over here loves some Lara Croft. I was gonna say I would put her in one of the charmers uh, category, Lara Croft, because she gets into any situation. In most times that she's presented, she's wildly intelligent, Mm -hmm. but then she uses her feminine wiles when it's necessary to uh, break down the defenses of the the male target that she's, you know, trying to get past or whatever. Um, But then she's not so callous with it that it goes into, you know, a like, okay, she's over overtly sexualizing this. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the video games, they did that, but let's take a look who they were pandering to. But a lot of the movies, she's she's brought in as, like, a charming person, and, like, she can just kind of ebb and flow her way through just about any situation between her intellect and her charm. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So, like we did with the villains, I think I'd like to go around the table real quick, and any favorite heroes of yours that we haven't mentioned before we leave you today? Any favorite heroes? Just, just like, first thing that comes to your mind, your absolute favorite hero. If I wanted to start a fight, I have one that would just be funny, but it's not my favorite. No, no, no. no, no. Oh. I just want to start a reactionary fight of Bella Swan. <laughs> <laughs> that's my troll <laughs> answer. That's more of an eye roll, though. That, that's you my know. Troll <laughs> Everything's still a better love story than Twilight. <laughs> <laughs> I could go go on about that, but. Out of everyone here, I'm probably the only one who actually owns all the movies. Um, yeah. I've seen all the movies. Yeah, I own them. And I've, I, I've <laughs> read all the books. Yeah, I never read the books. I read all the books. I had no interest, and in, I had a buddy who worked at Barnes & Noble, a little south of here, and when the first movie came out, they got in like an extra shipment of the DVDs because it was supposed to be, oh, it's this big phenomenon. Well, no one's really going to Barnes and Noble to buy movies. I was going in there because you could find like hard to find shit. I walk out to check out with my movies. I think I was buying something stupid like Holy Man. You know, if you remember that gem of an Eddie Murphy movie. And he looks me in the eye and he's like, please take a copy of Twilight. And I'm like, I'm not spending money on that, dude. <laughs> I, I, I hadn't even seen it. Didn't want to see it. And he, he's just like, no, no, you don't understand. We're overstocked on this and we can't sell it. I am giving you a copy of this because, and, and he's like, lean over the counter. I leaned over the counter and where he was standing was the only walkable space. He was surrounded by deep stacks of DVDs of Twilight. So he handed me the first one. I begrudgingly watched it. And because I have a completionist mindset, I'm like, God damn it. And I had to watch the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, so mine is actually a, a book based hero. Okay. That turned into a TV show, which I was actually first introduced to him through the TV show. Okay. Legend of the Seeker, Richard Cipher. I'm um, familiar with the show. I never read the books. The books are amazing. It's where you actually get to see this guy as a true hero. The TV okay. show is like just this ridiculously puffed up version of what the studio thought that Richard Cipher should be and actually Terry Goodkind is like please don't watch the TV show <laughs> it is not what my vision was they skipped past all of this stuff all of the character development all of these things that Richard Cipher went through and I have to agree um, as someone who watched the series first and was like okay when I got into the books I'm like wait they didn't even do all of this that was in the, mm. in the TV shows and then I started reading more and more and more and I've gotten so much further through the series um, and I haven't completed it yet but he has gone through so many trials and tribulations that he has so much heart and so much of that hero mentality that he will die for anybody that he is there to protect hmm. um, and so he leads with just a really dynamic um kind of he's he's got inner turmoil he has a lot of the reluctance and all of these other things but then when it comes time he steps up and he does what has to be done um he exhibits wisdom and courage at every turn and so he's just been one of my favorites all right 
Yeah. Back around the table to Am- like Amber. Amber. Okay. Yeah. Your serious answer, Miss Swan. <laughs> <laughs> My real answer is Imperator Furiosa, mm. aka Charlie Theron. Mm-hmm. Because anything Charlize, it's like Mila. Anything Charlize does is fucking amazing. Yeah, I can't. I really can't think of a bad. Aeon Flux, movie. Ultraviolet. She's got a few bad ones, it, but they're still uh, enjoyable. Aeon Flux as a movie is bad, but that's Charlize. But her role is spot on. Yes. Yeah. It, it's she it's does odd. a great job with everything she's in. She's real uh, flexible. Italian, <laughs> well, Italian job too. She was awesome in that. Yeah. yeah. That was kind of when she was on the rise. That was when she was Because that so was before early. Monster, too, I believe. That was pre-Monster. That made me want to put her in the badass category because of how she drove I that know. mini. We need to just have, like, badass chicks. Um, I'm but, okay yeah. with this. That's a whole episode. That's a whole different badass episode. Badass chicks. Uh, but Furiosa. I loved her in that movie. It made me want to shave my head and be a badass chick and shoot guns and save people. But and she'll never be in another one, unfortunately. She might She might get her own spinoff, so, so there's rumors. But apparently Charlize and, uh, crap, I forget his name now. Tom Hardy? Or Tom Hardy. Or? Tom Hardy did not get along. Um, well, so. I feel like Tom Hardy's the kind of actor that he doesn't enjoy sharing the spotlight. But I think the bigger problem with the Mad Max series is just that we have a timeline on how long do we have the director. Yeah. He's but, like in his 80s, isn't he? Yeah. But he doesn't want to relinquish control of the franchise, so. But everyone's been a absolute phenomenon, so. And then he goes. If, if, it, if he goes away and the franchise dies, that I'm okay with that. You I know? don't think that's a, the better thing for it. I'd rather the franchise dies than for it to. Peter out with bad entries. Bad people to try to revive but there are it. And then bring in special more. effects instead of amazing real stunts. Yeah, because I think. The only real special effect in Fury Road was like the storm and the three in the steering wheel with the three D and the, like the way they made it three D. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. stuff was weird. So. But she's my entry. Okay, Senior Reach. All right, this could be a weird one for most people, but yeah, I got a obscure one. <laughs> Not obscure, just you don't think hero when you think you know Rocky Balboa. No. no. Okay. Um, yeah, Amber doesn't care for Stallone, <laughs> which is unfortunate because he does have some really, really awesome. phenomenal movies. Yeah. He does outside I the just action like the movies. Rocky forgets it's Stallone for a minute. He's the champion of Philadelphia. Come on, he takes a whole city on his back. It, he represents it's, America. Amber, do you hate America? <laughs> it, and it's strange because I don't he, think America should be represented by an Italian American. Damn. Uh, Man, that's some uh, uh, 30s and 40s hatred there. Damn. I mean, damn. I am kind of Irish. Oh, well. oh, shit. There's some butthurt feelings there. <laughs> wow. But, I mean, you you are correct. It's a fictional character that Trent the real-life yeah. Philadelphia latched onto, and that yeah. statue from 3 is actually <laughs> real. It's It's a... Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, like, like you said, the statue's real. Uh, it's one of the most visited monuments in the entire city. Went there a couple years ago now. And yeah, I, that was the one that had the longest line. Besides, besides the, the Liberty Bell. So what makes him your your pick for your favorite hero? I would say he's just an average dude that didn't really believe in himself at first. And then he, you know. He trained hard. He worked hard, and then started getting that mojo back. And because he, he when he fought Creed for the first time, he was ass whooped. Yeah, he started mm-hmm. doubting himself, and then you know Mickey's like, "Get away, you suck, kid! <laughs> yeah, gotta quit on me now. You gotta yeah. catch that chicken." Yeah, <laughs> and he basically didn't give up on himself, and you know he reached down. You're embarrassing me. Get up, you bum! <laughs> <laughs> and he conquered. You know, he conquered his biggest obstacle, beat Creed, and then became the. Beat Creed twice. twice. Yeah. And though they never show it in the film, they talk about it in Creed. He didn't beat Creed a third time. Oh, that's when, when they have that private match, it's because, uh, is his name Adronis? Adronis. Um, talks about that. It's like, well, who, who won in that secret match? And he just chuckles. And he's like, your dad did, of course. He's like, he always won. That's how it is. Yeah. Okay, I'm going kind of obscure, just because we'll we'll get to it some other day. But my favorite TV show of all fucking time 
is still sliders. Oh, that's okay. So I'm going to mention Quinn Mallory. Good. All right. Choice. All right. Because he, that character was what inspired me to be like a scientist and an engineer. I, I grew up watching that show like with my dad and really, really got into science. And, I, you know, I'm reading some of that quantum mechanics stuff as a kid in elementary school and just fascinated by it. And it's like, granted, okay, I realize that's a, it's, fictional show but it was this kind of real life character who kind of screwed up scientifically and had to step up and become a hero you know he's traveling these different dimensions and going oh okay well well the nazis are here you know the soviets are taking over there was that one episode with vampires i a little confused by that one um <laughs> but he always steps up and just kind of takes charge and it's but he uses his mind you know, later on in the series, it did kind of change to like an action-y show um, because the producers wanted more action, which kind of hurt it, in my opinion. But in the beginning, it was all brains. It was him and uh, Professor Arturo. It's like, oh, how do we do this? Oh, well, this is how we did it on our world, so let's try it here. <laughs> it, it really, because it pushed my personal life in a certain direction, that's what I usually like to go back to. I like it. All right. Yeah, so I think that that about wraps up the what the heroes episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and I just real quick note: notice that in the heroes episode, we never once talked about heroes. The oh, oh the TV so. show, yeah, yeah. It's okay. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's okay. For, <laughs> forget the cheerleader. Forget the series ever happened. Nobody saved. <laughs> nobody saved the cheerleader, was, so they didn't save the world. It was a moment in time that we needed to happen to springboard the good stuff. Yeah. yeah. I, Though I will, the, the first season's good. But for its that. time, it it was a kind of a groundbreaking this. series. Yeah. And it respawned the the whole hero genre of everybody like. Getting it, into that mindset. It started before the MCU. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. It it had me chomping at the bit for a real X Men series. Yeah. Now we got two of them. Yeah. And they're okay. They're okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. With, with with that said, uh, we thank you for for listening to the Nerd Her podcast. If you enjoyed our show, give us feedback on all of our social media channels. Again, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, we, we also have the show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Amazon, Pocket Cast, CastBox, and Intune. You forgot YouTube. Oh, yeah. Well, that's not pop And video. Yeah. We're okay. putting it up on YouTube. We're putting it up so on YouTube. And check it out there. Yeah, Basically, the wherever yeah. you like to listen to podcasts. If you can't find us, you ain't looking. <laughs> well, we're, but, hey, listen, we're not trying to be cocky about it. We're trying to be accessible because yeah, we're we realize that everybody blast, has everything. their favorite that they yep. like mm -hmm. to be on. So we'd like to be there. So if in that uh, uh, spirit, if you are looking for us on your favorite platform and you don't see us, drop us a line. We want to be there. We will do whatever it takes to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. So until next time, Nerd Herd. Out.